Hi, my name is James R. Hamilton. I'm the minister of Full Reformed Evangelical Chapel here in North Staffordshire in the United Kingdom. We are studying the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 9. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Answer, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth, with all that in them is, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father, in whom I so trust as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul, and further that whatever evil he sends upon me in this veil of tears, he will turn to my good, for he is able to do it, being almighty God, and willing also, being a faithful father. The primary here is that Christ is my father, Christ's father is my father. And secondly, secondly, that he created and upholds the universe and everything in it. Now you must not put the latter before the former. Because if you do, you put the creator and upholder, sustainer, before the father, then all you've got, all you're left with is just a creator, a provider and a sustainer. You're left with a philosophical treatise and no comfort. Remember, do remember, that the Heidelberg Catechism is it's a document, it's a confession, it's, um, it's for the comfort of the believer. Very, very practical. Creation, providence and the generation of God, all that is very, very important. Freely acknowledge that. But firstly, who and what God is and how he relates to us as believers what he means to us is primary is first and foremost here this is what we must grasp to trust and to rely upon him as our God and Father to the extent that we have no doubts wow the fatherhood of God's our comfort in life and death this is for children and for grandparents. This is for the, the whole church, the whole believing community. Confessing, this God is my Father. So what do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father? That for Christ's sake, He is my Father too. The God and Father of Christ. That His Father is, of course, independent of His being creator and sustainer. The latters are add-ons, so to speak. You know, you download some software and then on the back of it you're invited to, you know, to enjoy these add-ons. They'll uh, supplement, they'll, they'll help your, you know, the software that you downloaded. So if you want them, you, you download them. These are add-ons. He's my father, he's the father of the believer. And the add-ons is, he just, he's my father, but he just happens to be the creator and sustainer of the universe too. He's eternal, the eternal father of the eternal son. Not saying that, um, that the God who created his father, but the eternal father of Christ is our father too. That's what the catechism is saying. That's what it's driving at, primarily. Father is his being. God is Father and always has been. He's eternally Father. That is, without beginning and without end. Being Father belongs to God as light does to the sun, which shines even though you don't see it. Earthly fatherhood is a faint expression of God's fatherhood, but not even a millionth part of it, a very, very poor expression of it. 
the, fa the Father of Christ. He's our Father for the sake of Christ. No Christ, no Father. If Christ is not your Saviour and your Lord, then God is not your Father. And neither, neither do we measure the love of our Father by his favour or his frown. He's the Father of Christ and he works everything. He works all for Christ's favour. And if Christ's glory requires that we, his children, bear a cross, then so be it. Because all that the Father does, he does in the interest and for the honour of his Son, first and foremost. And so he's a father of the elect. When you and I, when we pray for relief from misery and from oppression, if it honours Christ, if it honours Christ, we find that um, in the book of Revelation that the kingdom, it doesn't come with tranquility. In fact, the very opposite, there are wars, famine, persecutions, there's martyrdom. Yet we never, never doubt. In spite of this, we never, never doubt the Father's love. Christ is first. He's above all. He comes first in the Father's mind. And everything he does, he does for his Son's honour and glory the son's interest. So what do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth and all that is in them, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father, in whom I so trust as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul, and further that whatever evil he sends upon me in this veil of tears, he will turn to my good, for he is able to do it, being Almighty God and willing also, being a faithful Father. Yes, yeah, secondly, he's the God of creation. But of course, this, uh, there's a restriction here too, because he's the father only of those who confess and those who honour Christ, those who trust in Christ and in his finished work. You ignore Christ, then God is your judge and not your father. You don't accept Christ's satisfaction, then you have to make your own. And of course, we've already learned in previous Lord's Days in our Catechism that none can do that. But he has the same father love towards us, towards his children as he does his son. And what is the sign? What is the sign of his love? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ says in the Gospels that there is only one sign that will be given, the sign of Jonah. Remember Jonah, the Old Testament prophet, the one who was spewed out of the, the whale's belly. Some people talk about Jonah. You might have heard a Sunday school teacher or somebody saying, you know, that Jonah was the frightened runaway prophet. He wasn't frightened at all. He was, the, he was courageous. He's a, type, he's a type of Christ. He knew exactly what God was going to do to, to Israel. He was going to raise up the Ninevites and he was going to use them to whack Israel. So he thinks to himself, if he jumps ship at Tarshish and gets out of the place and doesn't go to Nineveh as he's been instructed to, that he'll save Israel. His plan, his scheme, you see, is to save Israel. But of course, God's having none of it. And the storm comes. And so what do they do? They cast them into the sea. 
He cast him into the sea to still the storm, to appease the storm. And just in the same way, you see he's a type of Christ in the same way. Christ was cast into the world by the Father in order to still his wrath. There is the sign of Jonah. And there is the sign of the love of God for his people in sending his son, in giving his son up to the death of the cross to make propitiation for our sins. That's the greatest, that's the primary, that's the sign of the Father's love for his people. He's the God of creation who of nothing made earth and with all that in them is, is in them and who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence from nothing. You know, we often, as children, we boasted, exaggerated as children as to what our fathers could do. You know, you remember those arguments in the street with the kids, you know, my father can do this and my father can do that, you know, and... Um, but there's no boast, there's no, there's no exaggeration here. My father created a universe and my father sustains the universe and my father can do everything and anything that he wills to do. No boast, no exaggeration. In fact, we speak and we think too little of our father as God's people. Nothing's, in, nothing's impossible for him. And nothing's too difficult. He can do all. But no, you're right. He can't sin. Because sin's weakness and my father's strong. He does, he can do and will do all that he wills. And so you and me, we do well to trust the entirety of our lives to him. Without any doubt, no doubt at all. He formed all, he turned the universe's lighting system on and banished the darkness. Is he not able to banish the darkness from your life and mine? He hears the ravens cry, he carries the oceans. You know, you've seen a farmer walk across the yard with a, a, a bucket of water, you know, carrying a bucket of water or or a, you know, a man walking across a building site carrying a bucket of water. Well, God carries the oceans like that in his hands. Your needs are great, you say. He's even greater. Your foes are strong. He's stronger. He's the sovereign of heaven and earth. He created it all, formed it all, and he sustains it all. Your father and my father. For Christ's sake. So faith, so trust in him you see equals peace. We confess, you know, we confess that God is our Father on, on a Sunday on the Lord's Day on the Sabbath day and then Monday we live like orphans. You know? Because of what he is we can live life trusting him entirely without any doubts the catechism says shut trust shuts the door to doubt doubters don't trust trusting is to have rest total surrender to him when you surrendered something that means you've got rid of it you got rid of it you trusted it to him you forget about it and you move on. Because you see, our Father, our God, is the God of peace. And when we trust in, in Him entirely without doubting, we get His peace. Minds tranquilized with the peace of God which passeth all understanding. But often doubts, you know, are caused by expectations that are wrongly directed but to trust in him entirely so that we have no doubts at all 
Is this for real? Is this possible? Well, it's our expectations, you see, that's the key to this. Read the words carefully um, and you find the answer. The answer that is the cure to the doubts. It's, it's there. Necessary, the word necessary, all things necessary for bod body and soul. We expect no less and no more than God has promised. Now oftentimes he gives us more. Lord Jesus Christ says that it's enough if we are food and raiment. Now, that's not true the world over, I know, but this isn't true the world over, I know, but here in, in the United Kingdom, and the, well, in the West anyway, it's, um, it's a certain fact, is it not, that, that God has, has given us more, abundantly more than, than just food and raiment. We live in houses, some of us are luxurious and we have computers, gadgets that make life easy. You know, he's, he's given us abundantly more. But the problem is, we start to think that that's the norm. But it's not the norm. He gives us more. We take it, we set that as the normal standard and we take it for granted. And so when he starts to withhold some of that more, what happens? We start to doubt. Unjustified doubts. We say, you know, when we don't get that abundance, when we don't get that more, when we don't get that prosperity we want, we start to question God's love for us. God doesn't love me anymore. Unjustified doubt. And the same, of course, with evil. As I've already said, book of Revelation that spans the whole the whole millennium, the whole um, New Testament period from Pentecost to the time when Jesus Christ comes again, and there you see the you see the norm for the church, you see the wars, you see the persecution, you see the martyrdom. God hasn't God hasn't promised us immunity. He has promised us that hell will not prevail against us, but it will certainly try to. But here is the wonderful thing that God has promised to sanctify it. That whatever evil, listen, he sends, he sends, whatever evil he sends upon me in this veil of tears, he will turn to my good, for he is able to do it, being almighty God and willing also being a faithful father. Eh? The needs of our soul are promised. So much so that he withholds earthly things, temporal things, in order to protect our soul. Because sometimes these things wouldn't be good for us and it would lead to apathy and maybe even apostasy. It would be harmful for our souls. Much evil, much evil is made good by faith. You look at Gethsemane, yeah? You look at that through the eyes of unbelief and what do you see? Suffering and torment, agony. You think this is, this is awful. This is not good. You look at Calvary, you look at the cross, you say that's defeat, that's death, that's the finish, that's not victory. But through the eyes of faith, Gethsemane and Calvary are glorious, are good. It's God's plan. It's God's redemption being worked out. And God takes Gethsemane and Calvary and turns it to the best. And that's what he has promised to do for our evils. All the evils that come, that come upon us that he sends. They come from him. And he will sanctify them. He will use them. And he will turn. He will turn them to the best. Possible use. Sanctified. You and I. Believers were sanctified by sorrow and affliction. 
the fire removes the dross of evil. Viewed correctly, we can thank our Father for the evils that he sends us. Do remember they are sent by him. Amos 3 and 6 Does he not send good and does he not send evil? Can the bitter tasting medicine possibly, can it possibly benefit a person? Well, mother knows best, eh? You know, she, she pushes the dish, the, the child pushes the plate away from him and mother pushes it back again and she says, eat more. Because she knows best, she knows what the child needs. The child doesn't like the taste of it. The child doesn't want to eat it, but mother knows best the child must eat it, so she pushes the place plate back towards him and says, eat more. When the child needs medicine, bitter tasting medicine, the child doesn't like it, kicks and screams against it, but the mother knows that, that the child must have the medicine and its benefit. So God says, don't resist. The evils that I send you, don't resist them. I'll turn them to your advantage. And this veil of tears, you know, it's a sober, sober reality, isn't it? It is. This world is a veil of tears. A valley of tears. We're pilgrims, we're strangers. This is not our resting place. This is not our finishing place. I know that so many believers today, especially so in the Western world, are living for this world and the things of this world. You think this was heaven, it's not. It's a veil of tears, misery. Sin and its causes, misery, death. But in this veil of tears, in the misery that marks this world, and you can turn up the music as loud as you want, it's still there. It's still there. It's a preview of the eternal misery that's to come upon many who don't know God as their Father because they don't trust, they haven't believed on Jesus Christ, his Son. But faith, you see, knows that there's a door of hope that leads to eternal light and eternal delight. And even in the valley of the shadow of death, even there he can find comfort because he has an able and he has a willing and he has a faithful father who can and will do it. So faith, you see, rests in God and in God alone. We trust him alone or we don't trust him at all. We put all on the line when we trust in him. There's no plan B. So what do you believe when you say you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? That the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth with all that in them is, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father, in whom I, tr I so trust as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul, and further that whatever evil he sends upon me in this veil of tears he will turn to my good, for he is able to do it, being almighty God, and willing also being a faithful Father.